Well, wonderful. And thank you, Lisa, for that kind introduction. Let me go ahead and get my screen share going. I will say it is really awesome to hear so many people saying they're from Anchorage, Fairbanks. Um, I lived lived in Anchorage, Eagle River for about 25 years. And so it's just really nice always to have those connections that feel like home. Um, so today we're going to share a little bit about Polar Steam with you. I do plan it to be an interactive conversation. So if people have questions as we go or questions at the end, I've built in a couple, couple stops for questions. And then of course I'll take some at the end as well. So um, really one of the primary goals of Polar Steam is as a broader impacts partner for researchers. So. Um, let's, let me just share a little bit about Polar Steam to give you a little bit of context and background, and then we'll jump right into a little bit more. So Polar Steam is an NSF funded program, as Lisa mentioned, and it's run by an interdisciplinary team at Oregon State University. Um, the strength of this team is that it brings together expertise in broader impacts, in educator scientist collaborations, in art science integrations, and in polar research. You can see the four PIs um, collectively on the screen bring that, um, bring that experience. The two full-time implementation staff are myself and uh, Melissa Barker, who uh, also has experience in polar field collaborations. She was a polar trek teacher years ago, as well as some other professional development programs. She brings a strong background in science education as well. And I'll introduce a little bit more about myself in just one second. Um, so Polar Steam and how it came to be is, um, uh, you might recognize Janet's work. I just want to acknowledge Janet here in the room as running Polar Trek very successfully for many years. And many of you might also be aware that um, the NSF used to run the Antarctic Artists and Writers Program directly through NSF. And so in a new version, uh, NSF has granted Polar Steam to Oregon State University to run both in educators and the Antarctic Artists and Writers Program. So that's really exciting. And we're really bringing, uh, building on a strong legacy of both programs. Our, our vision is really to facilitate integrated programs within the STEAM uh, areas like Lisa mentioned, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So let me take just a little bit of a minute to introduce myself and a little bit more about my background, and then Julie will share a tiny bit more about her background as well. So um, as Lisa mentioned, I lived and worked in Alaska for quite some time. I have experienced teaching world geography. I also worked for Denali Commission, which supports a lot of rural infrastructure work throughout Alaska. And so, so through that experience, really gained a deep knowledge and appreciation for living and working throughout Alaska. Um, uh, I did take a sabbatical from teaching and, and was able to experience the Antarctic and get to work down there. And I worked directly with NSF supporting science in, in the seventh continent. And that was just a really awesome experience. Through both my education and polar experience, I have participated in quite a few professional development opportunities that combine educators with either researchers or other professionals in their field and to develop a rich learning experience for both parties. And so it's a real privilege to be able to help run Polar Steam and create and support those opportunities for other educators and researchers. And Julie, if you can just share maybe a little bit more about yourself and your broader impacts work, especially. Yeah, great. Thank you, Michelle. And this is this is mostly Michelle's show to share. So this is my opportunity. Of course, I'm happy to be answering questions as well. Um, I, I have a background actually as a, a marine ocean ecologist and um, have a lot of field science under my belt, although not in polar regions. Um, uh, so many similar challenges exist, though. Uh, and uh, as a marine ecologist and moved into policy and resource management, in particular community-based and participatory resource management, and as um, mid-career moving into a PhD in social science and studying collaborative learning across time and space and organizations. Um, and I spent about a decade as associate director of the STEM Research Center, where, which is the home of Polar Steam at Oregon State University. And it, on this project, we sort of see ourselves as a, 
um, a broker of broader impacts, I would say. It's through the STEM Research Center in, in which I uh, gained some national leadership experience and collaboration around broader impacts, in particular, moving broader impacts uh, practice um, assessment, uh, review, all of that forward through advancing research impacts in society. If you're interested in learning more about ARIS, that's um, researchinsociety.org is the, is the website there. There's a lot of different programs, a lot of ways that we support researchers, but in particular, we support other brokers, people who are brokering in broader impacts themselves. Um, so when the opportunity for Polar Steam came about, um, we really saw the center as kind of uniquely positioned to take this broader impacts lens with it and bring in our partner. So Susan, who you see here, who is an expert in, uh, in particular, uh, educator and researcher collaborations um, and bring some STEAM expertise as well. Peter Benjamin is the director of a place we call Prax, which is our creative arts center at OSU, which is brand new and quite an amazing place. If any of you ever come to Corvallis, please look us up. We'll take you to Prax. It's a really amazing place to be. And Kim, Bermar Kim Bernard, who's uh, she's, she studies Antarctic krill um, and really has, a, a, I, I guess, almost two decades of field experience to bring to the table and has done quite a lot of great broader impacts uh, collaborations herself. And so it was really fun to bring this group together and then to be able to bring Michelle um, in and Melissa Barker, who I think it just got cut off, who's our outreach and engagement lead. Uh, she's working directly with our participants and you'll learn more about that from Michelle um, to, to support this work. So yeah, thank you for inviting us here today. Go ahead, Michelle. Awesome, thank you so much, Julie. So here's the agenda of the items that we'll be covering today. I'm also going to share this contact information at the end, but I'm sharing it here at the beginning because I'll be referencing a couple projects that we've showcased so far on our social media recently. And um, some people might find that helpful to be able to look up either our website or our social media during the presentation as we go. So very brief overview, and then I'll get into some more details. As we've mentioned, Polar Steam is really a partner in researchers' broader impacts work. We work together with NSF-funded researchers in all disciplines, so that spans the social sciences, to physical sciences, to mathematics, technology, um, and a unique aspect of Polar Steam is that we offer both virtual and field collaborations. Many people will be much more familiar with what a field collaboration might look like, but virtual collaborations offer opportunities for researchers whose work doesn't necessarily lend it to itself to a traditional field collaboration. So we work with researchers who are lab-based, those who might be conducting remote sensing work, um, and even a couple technology-based researchers that um, have some really great collaborations. Uh, many researchers also want to know what the cost is to participate in Polar Steam, and there is no cost to researchers to participate in Polar Steam, no cost to researchers or to your grant. Educators' costs are fully supported through Polar Steam. Polar Steam is an inclusive program that really views our differences with curiosity and invests in diversity. We aim to forge connections with communities that are historically underrepresented in polar sciences. We're aiming to expand the roster of collaborating participants to elevate new voices. And we use an integrated approach to science communication to reach a broader audience of learners. We really embrace inclusivity and seek to elevate new voices traditionally underrepresented in polar sciences through our work. And I'll pause here for just a second and see if there are any initial questions that people have, things that you would like to learn about Polar Steam today, and I'll incorporate those as I go through the remainder of the presentation. You can feel free to either unmute or to pop that in the Q&A or the chat, whatever is most comfortable for you. Okay, great. I'll keep cruising along. If questions come up as uh, during the presentation, just feel free to pop them in the chat. So I wanted to start by sharing what some of our collaborations 
uh, look like during this coming year? Um, oh, I see Don. How does the program connect with local artists and educators in the indigenous communities? Great question. I'll weave that into the presentation. Let me share um, an example of some of the projects that we have over this upcoming year. We have four researchers and educators who will be working in Okiagvik, one who will be working in on the Kenai Peninsula, one on the Juneau Ice Field, a team that will be in um, Patufik and Kanak in Greenland, and then also a team that will be on the Varangar Peninsula in, um, in Northern Norway. We also have some Antarctic Southern Ocean teams as well, but I'll keep it mostly to Arctic folks this year. I mean this today, sorry. Um, so here's a, here is a, an example of the types of collaborations that we have put together. And I just want to highlight one of them specifically for you today to see what a virtual, I mean, what a um, in-person collaboration might look like in the Arctic. And the example that example I will share is Ignatius Rigger and Keegan Heron. They just recently had their field experience that was in the beginning of April. So just a month ago, they were up north in Kiagvik and Ignatius Rigger studies sea ice and how it interacts with the atmosphere and ocean. He uses a lot of buoys and places a lot of them um, as part of the International Arctic Buoy Program. He also uses these small wooden boats and that students can paint and then set them adrift in the Arctic Ocean and they have some location information on them so that they can be tracked. And so as part of the collaboration, Keegan Heron, who is a science teacher from North Carolina, uh, he teaches primarily ELL students, so English language learner students and almost exclusively students who are new to the country using this art-based project allowed his students to help connect with the place in, um, in Okiagvik, which is of course very far away from North Carolina. They painted these boats and Keegan brought them with him, which just kind of blew the blew students' minds. And then they helped to set them afloat in the, on the pack ice, which will hopefully eventually end up in the ocean and get tracked as part of this international buoy project. They um, also participated in um, bringing students from Hobson Middle School, which is in Okiagvik, onto the sea ice for a couple of days. They learned about scientific research. They had some stations that allowed people to practice traditional whaling. And you can see an example of that on the screen. And they also uh, measured albedo. Um, that's the photo of students laying on the ice. So it was a really interactive opportunity for Keegan and Ignatius to really learn from each other in their work. I also want to share an example of a virtual cohort uh, partnership and what that might look like. So I'll highlight Elizabeth Webb and Joseph Perry. So Elizabeth is an NSF post postdoctoral fellow. She uses high res and satellite images to study how climate change is impacting Arctic landscapes. And she's particularly interested in lakes. And um, so with these high res images, all of and this in this virtual collaboration, then Joseph is working collaboratively with her to develop some educational resources that can help students better understand um, the effects and impact of climate change in Arctic lake systems. Joseph teaches in New York State, and he teaches Earth and Space Sciences, and he's also an educational specialist with the state and works on test development and is also working with the team that is adopting new standards throughout New York State for science, and those standards are going to be heavily incorporating climate science. So that's really a benefit that he can be able to incorporate that into um, uh, incorporate that into um, the incorporate this work into the state standards as well. Um, and I want to come back to um, Don's question: How does the program connect with local artists and educators in Indigenous communities? So uh, there's two parts to that question. In terms of artists, the artist and writer program is Antarctic only. So we're not necessarily connecting with artists in the Arctic 
specifically. That's not the scope of our program, though our program does work with educators across disciplines. So we welcome art educators. And um, so there may be a little bit of mixing there, but with, with an educational lens. Um, connecting with educators in indigenous communities. I think the example of Keegan, um, Keegan and um, Ignatius and connecting with Hobson Middle School that showed a really rich way that educators and researchers could connect with local communities. And UIC Science in Okiagvik helped to coordinate and facilitate that. So I think it was a really, really great opportunity to be able to include them. There, um, There's also a couple of collaborations that are very social science focused. And I'm just gonna go back a couple screens here so I can, there we go. Couple social, couple of research projects that are pretty heavily social science focused. A couple of them are in. One of them is NNA, and one of them has a strict social science lens. So Matthew, no, Michael, sorry, Michael Koski, Yoko Kugo, and Megan Nalon. Their work work will be taking place in Amiktuvik Pass, and Michael and Yoko study food security issues in Onyctuvik Pass and how those and and a couple other communities and specifically how those are changing um, as the climate changes. Their entire research is driven through community needs. So the the community's needs drive their research as opposed to the research driving um, what the community might receive. So they they really have a community first model. Megan is going to be an excellent partner because her entire academic work is focused on gardening and on food security issues in LA where she teaches. So she is a an informal educator and te but goes into schools to teach schools how to set up gardens. They actively set up gardens. They talk a lot about um traditional gardening practices and um, especially with many of her students who come from agricultural backgrounds and so they're really able to connect that. So that's one example of ways that um, these researchers and educators are connecting, connecting with local communities. Okay, I'll jump ahead here. Um, so getting involved, uh, many researchers want to know what the steps would be to setting up one of these collaborations. And you can see some examples of people who have gone through this process and we've connected into matched pairs. And so let me just explain a little bit about how we do that. So many people want to know who the educators are that we work with. So we work with educators in all STEAM disciplines. We're open to educator applications from people who can find those curriculum and classroom connections with polar science and integrate them into whichever courses they are teaching. We also work with educators at several different levels, middle and high school um, educators. We work with educators at community colleges and MSI serving institutions. And we also work with informal educators. And I mentioned Megan, she's one of, one of the examples of an informal educator that we're working with this year. And so that's one way that or one um, type of informal educator, but other informal educators might be people who work at museums or science centers. And um, we have another educator who works at Pacific Science Center in Seattle. She'll be going up to Kiagvik this coming summer. And so that really broadens the ability for us to recruit educators that uh, that come from that come from many different disciplines and really help their students access polar science through multiple lenses beyond maybe a science lens and though the science lens remains important this is a science audience science is always important um, one of the things that NSF uh, funds us to do is to help to set uh, help to match pairs of researchers and educators in a really intentional way that is going to allow for success in a collaboration. So we run a national search for educators and do some vetting and screening. 
And then the heart of our matching process is educator researcher matching meetings where people can get, to, we facilitate those, people get together and discuss both of their professional goals and interests. And then it's uh, Melissa and I that really work in the background to put together matches that align people's interests and professional goals so that we can make this a really rich learning experience for everyone involved. Once we've completed recruitment and have our matches put together, then um, the cohort launch, the, the cohort would launch in February. And so we're currently building our roster of potential collaborators for the 2025 summer season. So about a year from now. And um, we'll be launching our educator applications shortly. And in fall, we'll be having educator researcher matching meetings that I was describing then a selection and notification as we go into the cohort work. Once we launch our cohort, what does the next part look like? So um, the groups that we match and all the people that I showed you before on the screen, they become part of our annual cohort of Polar Steam Fellows. And this, the cycle of the cohort includes a beginning phase where we're launching the cohort, building community, and then we also have a phase where everyone is learning from each other. So really important for us to have educators sharing their professional knowledge, researchers sharing their professional knowledge and create a rich learning experience for everyone, both within the team, as well as within the full cohort. The intensive period of most collaborations is kind of in the middle somewhere, and it's the field work portion or the more intensive virtual portion. So most people working together virtually will pick a time frame that makes the most sense for them to really dive in and accomplish their work. And um, then as we move further through the year, we have some STEAM integration times where we're collaborating, sharing, um, giving some feedback to each other within the cohort, and then a showcasing element at the end once everyone has completed their work and their educational resources that they would like to share out. I'm going to take a pause here for some questions, and I see my chat has a couple that I haven't seen yet. And then also same as before, um, you're welcome to just come off mute. Let's see. Yeah, we, uh, oh, good job. Nice. <laughs> Rami, I suggested maybe go ahead and verbally ask this one. This is quite an intricate question. It'll be, I think, easier to answer that way. Great. Okay. Is it? Okay. I think it's working there. Yep. Um. It's, I suppose it's really a, a multifaceted question, but I'm I'm curious in in the the reflexivity, I guess, of mm -hmm. participants, and and if if the if the communities receiving, in a sense, as participants, are they reflecting on a future of careers of job security of like continuing to do this work and be excited um are there questions about like how, like where does it go from here in that sense or is it about the phenomena is it about the questions and the practice um is it about the interests does that does that verbally kind of unpack that question a little bit um, yeah, I think I understand. Let me just say it back to make sure that I understand. So are you asking specifically about the showcasing timeline where people are reflecting and whether that reflection is career related and next phases in a career or whether that reflection is sp specifically focused on the educational resource and people's experience with Polar Steam? Is that what you're wondering? Yeah. And then, and then I guess that that process of reflection moving forward like it seems like that's kind of the that opportunity in the what's next is where i kind of was curious about about that great question okay great i'm glad i'm i'm glad i'm tracking and understanding what you're asking for 
So um, one element of the showcasing is absolutely about showcasing people's awesome work that they've completed in Polar Steam, sharing and reflecting on that, and, um, and kind of moving forward on that specific work. There isn't a specific portion of our program that mm, requires or supports those long-term enduring connections or people's next phase and growth in their career. However, um, many people, as Janet can attest, stay in contact for years with educator, researcher, pairs. People will generally, or sometimes do stay in contact for years and do continue growing in their careers together, either continuing in a collaborative manner or possibly supporting each other in a different direction in their career, if that's where people are moving to. So um, while that's not specifically baked into um baked into our program that does that does happen that's just a natural um outcome the other part you'd mentioned something about early career researchers and i do want to touch on that but let me check first did i answer your other question um yeah yeah i think i think this dovetails right in so please continue thank you perfect michelle i can uh, I, I, would like to just elaborate on a couple things just to just parts of Mamie's questions that I picked up but might be helpful is um Michelle's correct that there's no like explicit long long-term support provided for folks after however one of the things that we've done in the program is really tried to set up researcher and educator collaborator collaborators those are the ones we have experience with already right um as co-designers of what they're creating and um, they're, they're all called fellows, for example, everyone has sort of like an equal, equal setting and the meetings that Michelle was talking about facilitating, those have been pretty critical in setting up, uh, constructive relationships that are really reciprocal. So, but ultimately we're leaving it up to those team members, the researcher and the educator to understand, um, their impact and how they can best make an impact through the types of work they're doing in their collaboration. So for educators, that means who is their audience? We gave the example of the ELL learners, just the awareness that there's human endeavors in the polls um, is, is, an, is of interest to them and that they could be part of that. So we're leaving it up to the educator and researchers expertise about what the appropriate impact is for their work, but trying to set up the collaborative structure so they can really thrive in that. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say, but the a, a sort of in, um, implicit goal too is to establish new long-term collaborations, which Michelle alluded to, right? So by setting up these relationships and really attending, we, we attend pretty um, in a fairly confrontational way to like the potential power dynamics, for instance, between a researcher and you know, a sixth grade educator. Uh, a lot of past collaborations, and, and I'm sure Janet can speak really well to this as well, you know, that there's a power dynamic that leaves the educator in service to and not in collaboration with. And so we try to set that up in order to be supportive of these sort of longer term partnerships, but the program itself doesn't take on the long term facilitation. Awesome. Thank you, Julie. And um, so regarding early career researchers, one of the focuses that we do have within our cohorts work is building broader impacts toolkit. And so for researchers who are earlier in their career, uh, the, this can really help them develop their BI toolkit so that as they continue to apply for future NSF or other funded grants, they've built their skill set in how to communicate their science, work with educators and other interested people to help bridge that gap. And so one way that we do this is we have, there are two researchers this year who are not PIs on their grant, but they are researchers on the grant in collaboration with the PI, always, um, we set that early career researcher up as the fellow, as the lead collaborator in this, in this project. 
And so they really take a leading role and we have them as part of our cohort, just like every other fellow, but they get that opportunity to really build that skill set, even though they're not yet a PI on a grant. And so that really gives them some good, awesome career development to be able to take their Polar Steam success and apply that towards maybe their first proposal for funding or some other whatever their next career move might be. So we're really hopeful that the broader impacts work that we have baked into our cohort curriculum, along with maybe mentorship with uh, researchers who are at different levels of their careers, maybe some mentorship along with the BI work in our curriculum helps helps advance their careers as well. Um, just really, I thank you very much for taking this much depth with this. And maybe for some others attending, it's a little bit not in the same field, but as we move these collaborative things forward, we this is such an integral part of how labs are going to be operated, how ships are still going to be tended, how mm -hmm. techs are still going to be funded. Like, so this is this is a really important thing. So I really appreciate you taking that time with that. No problem. Thank you. Appreciate the questions. Um, we're reaching the end of the official presentation, and then I have a few minutes to stay on for additional questions if there are more. Um, I just want to give some information about next steps that people could take if they're interested or know of a colleague who might be interested in pursuing this type of a collaboration. Often we find that it is great to just set up a 20 minute consultation with the researcher and our team to discuss any project specifics or questions you might have prior to submitting an application. So you can email uh, us at the address on the screen if you'd like to set that up. If all your questions have been answered here today and um, then you can go ahead and submit an application that's directly on our website. And if people are pre-planning for future years or working on submitting a proposal, you can also reach out to us so that we can be a partner in helping to develop the BI section that might be related to Polish Steam for a future proposal. And I promised I would put our contact information back up on the screen. If uh, you can always sign up for our email list and um, and then we send out a notice every time that the researcher applications open up or we have any researcher specific events. And so we'd be happy to have you join us there. And um, I'll pause again. Uh, this is the end of my presentation, actually. So I'll leave the contact info on the screen for a minute, but I'm happy to take any other questions either verbally or through chat. Sarah. Yeah, I apologize for being late. So you, um, <laughs> this may have already been addressed. I've been trying, um, so I'm a Polar Trek alumni, um, but I'm just curious. Um, I would love to follow along with people like Keegan, who just went up to Utjavik and like see his stories. And I don't, I can't find anywhere. And I'm, so I'm just curious, what is the expectation of these teachers going and like for, for all of us to be able to see their stories and and learn through them and live vicariously through them and etc sure I'm thinking blogs and right whatever yeah <laughs> yep so um if you want to live vicariously you can hop on over to the socials and um we have a couple of social posts up from Keegan's recent yeah I saw the one on LinkedIn I was just but so there's not an expectation they're not that's not how it works that's not the um, program is that true no, so that's <laughs> because we're a Polar Trek alum, I'll kind of address the that specifically. So we do not have as heavy of a blogging requirement as mm -hmm. Polar Trek educators did. So yeah. just your point of reference, though, we are um, working to add a blog plug in to our website. So we will have a way of people sharing a little bit more um, in more of a blog style format for people who choose to consume information that way. Um, along with socials. And Keegan was our first field educator. So that's, you know, the first of many over the summer, but yeah. I see. Cool. And so um, my second question, I have Sarah, two Sorry, I'll, I'll also just say that, you know, one of the things that we're doing, so Keegan just got back, right? <laughs> like just, so you might've missed that part. No, um, I know. So I, I know very well. <laughs> we're, we're doing is really trying to curate, curate things. So like like Polar Trek, you know, the what the educators do, having them share through their own 
pathways, but also curate it um, ourselves. And so that's a build out that we haven't actually done yet. We have the plans kind of in, in play. So, um, I mean, it was great to get him out and, and have that experience, that first experience. Um, that said, the reason I'm bringing that up is, you know, it's still a somewhat malleable space for us, right? And so we are, for instance, talking about a curated blog, but that's not an individual assignment. That's more of a collective process. Um, so if you have things, I, you know, we would love to hear uh, it, how, how people want to consume. Another thing that's on deck for us is a, a video content, right? So that we're, we're pulling together and curating uh, the experiences of, of educators to highlight and showcase what they have to offer, uh, kind of for that magnifying effect for other teachers, other educators to take that up and other scientists too. Yeah, it's, um, it's just a huge opportunity <laughs> to like build community around really cool things. Um, so now the second question I have is, so people are curious. They're like, what was Polar Trek? How did you get to do that? And I'm like, well, there's this new program. And um, I think I understand it that Polar Steam is really looking for teachers who haven't had 5 million cool opportunities, like Nat, you know, Nat Geo, Grobner's, like, um, or Teacher at Sea, like basically people that have already had really cool field experiences really are not encouraged to apply for Steam because there's no real like chance in them getting it. Is that true? Because that's how that's how I've understood it. And and I think it's great, perhaps, because it's le opening the field to a whole bunch more people, perhaps. I can, I can take that. So I wouldn't say they're not encouraged. <laughs> I would say the we so we do have an assessment, you know, a, a rubric, a review rubric, and we have external reviewers review the applications. And there is an emphasis in that rubric of providing oppor new opportunities to people who haven't had them before. So it's part of the rubric, but it's not the only thing. Um, so I wouldn't say they're discouraged. I, I would say that um, you know, we think a lot about the learners that those teachers are associated with and what access that those learners have to opportunity. So that's that's really our driving force. Um, it's not, I mean, it is also, you know, teachers having them, their own opportunity, but how that kind of um, a lot of resources for few learners is a, a pattern that we, we really are thinking about and wanting not to kind of contribute additionally to that. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, that's awesome. So it's, yeah, it's more about the community where they are and their impact to their community. Yeah, perhaps who they are reaching and, and how, how much that, and, and it is really, um, it's really wonderful to read teachers who are thinking about their community that may be underserved or has low access to these kinds of, of experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we want to find ways to support that where we can. Thank you. I can take the artists in the Arctic one. And Lisa, you can chime in if you like. So we're explicitly not um, selecting and sending artists to the Arctic because there are artists in the Arctic. Um, and that is out of the scope of our, our, our program. Um, some of the steam, steaminess of this comes from um, encouraging and supporting educators with some of the curriculum to use art as way of knowing um, in their work that they're doing with their students and in the products that they're developing. And as Michelle mentioned earlier, we've got art and music teachers involved, right? So it's not only science teachers using art, but art teachers using science um, in, in their work. So uh, we certainly have ideas and aspirations for thing, for ways that we would like to support ind indigenous artists in the Arctic in terms of um, connecting with the lower 48 for in, in particular. Um, but at this time that is beyond the scope. Oh, good, perfect timing, Lisa. And I was just gonna say, and Lisa can tell you more. Well, actually, I was just going to agree with you that that's, uh, we, we um, recognize that there are many artists already in the art, in the Arctic. So, uh, um, but, but incorporating their art into this project is always uh, useful. Um, I'm also going to say that we are 
just about out of time and I want to leave a little time for Kaya to mention our One STEM Hub. So thank you so much for that wonderful presentation and um, everybody stay on because Kaya has something to, to tell us about. Yeah, first, thank you, Michelle and Julie. Uh, that was very interesting. And thank you for taking your time to uh, talk to this audience. Um, for those of us who, or those of you who um, have been involved in the Arctic STEM conversations for a while, we set up one of our objectives to uh, establish a one STEM hub, we're calling it, as kind of a nexus of STEM activities in and about the Arctic. And short of us being able to fully staff that position, which is still an objective, we have put a website together that's hosted on the IRPIC page. And I think Meredith might be able to drop that in the chat if people can or would take a look at that. It's um, a first stab at the uh, effort right now, uh, looking at STEM opportunities, mainly for students, um, but we also welcome your feedback um, any comments that you might have for how we, how we might do this better organizationally or substantively. Um, again, this is our effort to try to advance that notion out into uh, a broader community. So any feedback is welcome. Um, we hope that uh, eventually we will be able to make this a staffed effort um, to have a two-way resource for people interested in STEM and and to get feedback on needs on STEM in the Arctic. So I'll just stop there. Thanks, Lisa, for um, giving our time. And Meredith, we had something else on the agenda. Yep, just a quick note to everyone um, in regard to what the STEM team is doing for the next two years. IARPIC operates under an Arctic research plan, which is a five-year plan, and then a two-year implementation plan. And we are, um, Lisa and Kyle will be updating the STEM portion of that plan. And so I'm dropping a link in the chat to a form where we are asking for feedback from the community on what should, um, what those updates should be, where the focus of each part of IRPIC should be, but for this group, most relevant would be the STEM team. And so you can use that form. There are links in there to um, the implementation plan itself, where you could look specifically at the STEM team's deliverables. And um, if you have opinions or thoughts on how those deliverables or the objectives could be improved, um, if there's things that are missing or things that are outdated, um, ways that those the wording could be improved, we really would value your input in IRPIC. Um, we take it really seriously and we try to be a, responsive to every comment. I see the question about the hub being US-based and uh, uh, it is mostly uh, opportunities that are made available for the, by the US federal agencies. And uh, Kaya, do, do you have comments on that the international? Yeah, I don't think, I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head, I think we might have included a couple from Canada um, in what we did. But uh, yeah, at, at this point, we have sort of a loose grasp on the universe of things that we are including. Um, although, as Lisa said, most of them are U.S. based. Um, if you have ideas for other places, please send them to us. We haven't really established concrete, uh, very tight parameters on what we will and will not include. So feel free to, to send those to us if you have some ideas. There, there is one in Greenland. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe a few. So take a look and see what you think and give us feedback. I want to thank Michelle and Julie again. Thank you so much. You did a fabulous job. We really enjoyed hearing about the project and um, hope that everyone will join us for our next uh, event, um, which will be in about three or four months. We'll be sending out notice. Thank you. I would encourage you all, if you are no artists, uh, we're not recruiting for artists right now, but we will be. 
um, our educators in the Arctic, you know, we talked a lot about researchers and how they can get involved, but please send them our way. You know, uh, one amazing thing, opportunity that we have is actually, you know, set, hope, having indigenous artists interested in doing also artistic and creative practice in Antarctica, right? There's some interesting opportunity there, not, not immediately, but eventually. And um, also just uh, our, uh, educators, who work in the Arctic, right? Having those collaborations would be really wonderful. Okay, well, we are right at the hour. Any, any last second uh, comments? Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you for joining this group. Uh, I look forward to hearing about all the great things that you're doing as well. Uh, send Kaya and I a uh, note if you want to, if you've got ideas for future presentations as well, projects that you'd like to highlight for this group. I think that that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. <laughs>